I've been talking a lot about pastoral care and learning communities in my tweets recently. I thought it would be useful to record this video as a slightly different way to present that information that some people might find a little bit more accessible. It also gives me a chance to kind of go into a bit more detail than the tweet limit allows. Um, so this is a presentation I gave about a week ago. Um, I hope you find it useful. So this presentation is blended remote pastoral care. So we'll start off with what is pastoral care? And actually it's quite hard to settle on a precise definition. In the literature, there's a lot of different definitions used and actually each university seems to take have their own slight take on what they consider to be pastoral care. Um, and the word even comes from uh, parishes. So even in that sense, it's it's not quite a consensus on what we mean by this. But the definition I quite like to use is academic, emotional and social well-being support delivered by the community, the, the, the parish, the, the university uh, learning community. Um, and that can be the lecturers, that can be the tutors, but it can also be the students and the peers as well. It's about a community coming together to ensure the community and everybody's well-being within that group. So why is pastoral care going to be different in 2020? Um, well, obviously we're in quite a, an unprecedented time. Um, we've got a pandemic. We've got the risk of moving in and out of lockdown. And it's it's a very different learning environment next year. Um, we've got things like blended learning, um, which for many students will be, this will be their first experience of what blended learning really is. You know, I mean, maybe they've had some slight taste of it in the past, but we, you know, the sector is largely moving into a blended learning. And that change of kind of educational setup might cause stress, might cause worry. Um, socialization. And by socialization, I mean people actually um, being without human contact, people feeling isolated from society. And yes, we're doing physical isolation, we're doing social distancing, but we don't want to be doing social isolation and we don't want people to feel like they're on their own. And pastoral care is, is, uh, has a major part to play in, in preventing people from feeling that way. Uh, mix of student expectations. I think students are not entirely sure what to expect from next year, especially new students coming back. Um, so A-level students coming in or, or BTEC or students from college and sixth forms, they're going to have no idea what university is going to look like. And actually the, the story they'll have heard of university all through their kind of educational experience will probably be quite different. Um, we've also got the risk of lockdown. Um, we've we've ha already had a few cities um, go into a local lockdown um, and th there's this threat of a second wave, especially as things go into winter. So there's a chance that our already kind of slight isolation, social distancing could get slightly more uh, developed as we go along. Um, and we need to be prepared for that and we need to be mindful that that could be coming. Um, long summer. So why is a long summer a problem? Um, everybody knows that um, when you, you take a long break from something, it can take you a while to kind of upskill and speed back up into the process. Um, anybody who's been on a really long vacation or potentially taken a sabbatical knows that getting back to work can actually be quite a jarring experience. And it's the same for students as well. We'll have had many students will have had largely the longest summer that they'll, you know, have experienced in their educational life. Um, and on top of this, they might have been broken from processes that would normally help them. So we have to be aware that for some people, it's been quite a while since they were in an academic environment and some of them might find that a bit strange. Fear. Now, I don't really want to go into fear too much. Um, but there's a lot people might be scared of going forwards. Um, fear of uh, what might be happening back home, um, fear of the, the there's a lot of uh, media fear as well. There's, there's a, a lot to be, it seems like the, the press and the media in the, for the last, honestly, for the last four years have actually been quite, it, it, it's worrying, okay? And, and that, that stress sometimes shows. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that fear in the middle of a pandemic is probably going to impact people's mental well-being. Um, broken support networks. Um, so at least when I was in university, I saw my parents relatively regularly. Uh, they came and visited. We would do things together. Now, that might be a bit more problematic next year. Again, we don't know what might happen with lockdowns. Um, government guidance may change between um, 
uh, visiting. You know, we there are going to be restrictions on how many people can be on campus, for example. Now, so those support networks that people have relied on may change quite dramatically next year. Um, one of the ones I'm really worried about is is a loss of serendipity, uh, a loss of chance encounters. Now, I like to think of most of my pastoral care actually happens quite. Um, it's emergent. It happens because I'm walking down a corridor and I bump into a student and they tell me something that's going on in their life and I respond to that. Now, in a socially distanced world where we are reducing the kind of risks of chance encounters, I mean, we, we don't want to be bumping into anybody. I mean, physically bumping into people. So where is that chance encounter going to happen? Where, how are we going to deal with that loss of serendipity? I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. And the final one I want to mention is, is screen time burnout. Now, it's something that I've been feeling as somebody who works quite long hours on my computer anyway. But now the usual things I would take to break me from computers, going for meetings, uh, going for coffee with a colleague, I can't do that in the same way that I used to be able to. So there's times that even I just want to turn off my computer and walk away from it. Now, if we're delivering a lot of pastoral care via the computer, we need to be mindful of this as well. So I've come up with some ideas for um, how to develop blended pastoral spaces. And this is, has a focus online um, rather than the, the kind of true kind of definition of a blend of being a mix of, of online and physical. Uh, the reason I've focused online is because there's a lot less practical guidance out there about... Um, online blended spaces so i thought this might be quite useful um these are my ideas these are things that i've come up with a lot of them have uh, a fairly strong evidence base behind them and I'm, I'm always happy to talk about that as well um but a lot of this is based on the context that i've experienced or, or experiments i've done in the past and trying to update them to kind of uh, match the current technology and the current situation that people are in the one thing I want to start with is saying that every student's learning environment will be very, very different. Um, I think sometimes we have a tendency to assume that when people go home, they, they go into a very um, standard environment, a very standardized space. And we realistically, we know that isn't the case. For some students, they're going home and they might be having... Uh, challenges with housemates or family members we don't know what their their home environment is entirely going to be like and we need to be mindful of this in our pastoral care for example it would be really hard to discuss um, maybe an argument you're having with your housemates via a web chat if your housemates are actually sat in the room with you um, and for that reason I think we really need to normalize uh, a wide variety of communication channels um, Creating this kind of normalization of um, different ways you can get in contact can provide people with a much more fluid way of informing you where there's an issue. They're not waiting for that web chat. They're not waiting for that video call. Um, maybe they can drop you an email. Maybe they, it's, it's um, different ways that they can express the challenges that they're facing. Um, and I know this doesn't sound particularly radical, but Things like uh, using Teams chat, uh, to, you know, dropping people messages, um, even things via kind of institutional social channels, social media channels um, can be useful. Um, but making sure those um, channels are normalized and people understand how and when to use them, I think it's going to be really, really important. Um, a big thing that I'm trying to do a lot with, with the teacher strategies I'm putting forward at the moment is create pastoral opportunities in talk sessions. Um, trying to, um, again, start, start off a talk session, a workshop, an online session, even a face-to-face -face session with a discussion of, of how people are getting on, what people have been doing, listen to their stories a little bit, trying to create, um, a safe environment where some of those discussions can happen and where, again, the, the community, the pastoral community, the learning community can come together and support the individuals within it. Um, and actually putting that into the talk session can really highlight 
the value of the community it can really show look you are you are in a room of friends you are in a room of colleagues you're in a room of people who understand and are here to help you um so just dedicating five minutes ten minutes at the beginning of a talk session can be really valuable here um learning communities are successful when um people know that they have um feel a sense of membership so feel some sort of ownership of that community um, when they feel they have influence over the community um, so that they can change its direction. They feel like they've got some sort of agency within that community. Um, when that community is fulfilling needs, and those aren't just educational needs, those are well-being, social needs, um, and one that has shared events. Um, so sometimes we call these campfire moments, things that um, frame the lunar community that allow us to have discussions and engage on that kind of level. So one thing we've been doing in uh, the computer science department at Lincoln for a while is these uh, live streamed video game sessions. So myself and uh, some of my just superb colleagues, we, we go online, um, four of us, we, we, we sell the ship. It's a game called Sea of Thieves and we just play the game and we use this as a space for informal discussions. So you see the live chat window there. We'll have students come online, will come talk to us. Um, and I've had students ask me everything from how does, should they best develop their portfolio? And me and the, my colleagues will sit and discuss that as a, as a theme for a little while. You know, we've even had students ask how to, I mean, one of the funny ones we've had was how to poach a salmon, you know. It's not so much about what the question is. It's about creating a space where those questions can happen. Um, and the nice thing about the game is, is it's a framing device. It's something a little bit silly. It's something a little bit humanizing. Um, one of my favorite sayings, and anybody who's been to one of my talks uh, will tell you, I don't think there's anything more humanizing than watching a person in a position of power doing something really badly. Um, and we're all pretty awful at video games, and it's quite funny watching us play this. Um, again, it, it's humanizing. It, it creates a, a framed space that we can have these chats. Um, and we've been doing this for about 18 months now, and these have been really successful. Um, and we've had some really good pastoral discussions there. Um, something else that we do is town halls. Now, a town hall, uh, for anyone not familiar with the model, is where you get everyone in a, uh, a space, a, the whole kind of community. We've been doing this by year groups. Um, and you have an open discussion about the challenges and things that people are facing. Now, those could be challenges with the program. Uh, maybe some part of university life just isn't quite working at the moment or there's, there's some genuine feedback that students want to give us. But for many people, this is a um, uh, a more comforting environment to have a discussion in um, because th th there's a certain um, courage that comes from being in a crowd. Sometimes it, you know, it, feels, it makes you feel a little bit stronger. And again, it's a good chance to have a really open, transparent discussion. Make sure the students know what's going on and, and you, um, you're being really clear and, and upfront with them. Um, town halls, we found them really useful. Now, we'll be doing some virtual town halls next year. And again, we're, we're looking currently the whether we should be doing these by year group or whether we should be doing those whole university or, sorry, whole university, whole school or both. And we're currently having those discussions at the moment. Um, but doing things like town halls on Teams uh, at Microsoft Teams or Zoom can be a really good place to have a pastoral discussion. And again, the important thing here is, is almost not what you're talking about, but the fact that you're getting people to court together. Um, it's, it's creating a space that that community can come together with. And something that I think is really important is highlighting hidden members uh, in that community. Now, Something I, I, I say quite often is we don't have a credits reel at the end of a lecture. You don't present your lecture and say, well, this was brought to you by all these people, you know, the, the AV team who, who set up the projector, you know, the, the estates team who've planned out the space, the timetabling team who've, who've done the absolutely amazing kind of box filling job of, of making sure that everyone's got a lecture in a space and a, a lecture in that room all at once. It's, it's you know, it's a massive job. And we don't necessarily do as good a job as we always can of, of really highlighting who those hidden members of the community are. And I say hidden members because um, they're not always student-facing. 
they're not always the first person that you think to. And again, for a lot of students, their their immediate learning community is the lecturer that's speaking to them. Now, why is this a problem? So there's a whole host of support departments and support structures that exist within a university that often students will never get to hear about. Now, how do we actually tell them? Now, we can put posters up, and we often do. Um, but one thing um, <laughs> I've been quoted at saying recently, if you want somebody to ensure somebody reads your poster, the best place to put it on is on the back of a cubicle stall door because it's the only time that you'll make sure that somebody sat down, bored, looking for something to read. Um, in the grand scheme of things, a corridor and a poster will nine times out of ten just be walked past and people won't see it. So think about different ways that you can communicate that information. Is there a newsletter that you can send out? Do you email the students? Do you put things out on your social media? Now, one approach we took to this was um, a little web series called Star in VR, um, which is what I put up here. Now, this is um, one of our ex-SU uh, leaders, Grace Korn. Um, and we created a virtual racing simulation. Um, this is our University of Lincoln branded Porsche 911. Um, and we did this all in virtuality and we had a bit of a race. Um, and the whole purpose behind this was to create something a little bit silly and, you know, a little web series um, where we could package up some useful information. And people would come and would watch this for the racing. There was um, a leaderboard and we'd have different colleagues kind of competing against each other. But during the race, um, they were answering interview questions that would, had been submitted by students. Now, this created a really interesting hook that we could present uh, information via, and this was really quite successful. Um, empower your learning community. And by empower them, I mean, make sure, again, give them that feeling of agency, that feeling of influence. Now, in computer science, we've been really fortunate. We've got some fantastic student reps um, they're really front and center and they're really good at acting as that bridge between um, the academic team and the students and make sure that they're empowered make sure that they've got the the agency and the ownership and they've got ways of communicating with students and support them in doing so um, again fantastic team this year and if if you take nothing else from this video work closely with student shooting and work closely with student rep is, is probably the, the the key piece of advice i would give um think about creating good news blogs um now a good news blog is a place where you cur curate um happy news that might be of inf interest to the community um we've had our reps this year have been absolutely fantastic and have worked on this uh, for a while um and they're starting to collect good news that they can present back to the community again it's it's about creating something nice and positive that people can engage with. Um, and that has a, a real kind of um, benefit on on how you feel. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but one thing I do is I curate nice emails I've been sent, uh, students who thanked me for for helping them through time. And I, I've got this folder in my email. If I'm ever having a down day, it's just nice to flick through and see some good news. Um, so a good news blog is a way of kind of doing that on a more kind of learning community scale and again we've got fantastic course reps this year who are doing exactly this they're creating these good news spaces um something i've been talking about a lot and again i mentioned this at the beginning was what think about where your your water cooler is going to be where is your virtual water cooler going to be um what i mean by this is uh, the, the idea of the water cooler moment you know two people going to get water and they have a conversation and again right at the beginning I talked about a lot of pastoral events involve people bumping into each other you know they, they just happen to see each other in the corridor and they have a chat most of my pastoral care and, and I, I generally believe um, academic staff and professional staff um, are also in need of pastoral care right we also need care from our community um, they're all days that you know we all feel a bit down you know we were um when we we're a bit tired or a bit stressed now again when i was on the compass I, I would bump into a colleague i would see uh somebody i haven't seen for a while and we'd just go for a coffee and that would make things a lot better you know that would help um it having those um serendipitous engagements removes the um the challenge and potentially the stigma of actually having to ask for help because somebody's there you, you've bumped into them you've found them 
So have a think about how you engage in serendipity. And one thing that we're looking at is creating a virtual common room. We're going to create a space where people can go online and and just engage in chats and discussions. Um, the students do this pretty well themselves, actually. I mean, most uh, cohorts I've seen have had Facebook groups or Discord groups. And these can be a really fantastic place to break out and have a conversation. Um, but again, I think creating, normalizing that and creating a space in the academic community where you can do these conversations, where you can have your water cooler moments, I think is going to be really important. Something I'm doing quite a lot is uh, working with games and play. Um, for example, I'm doing a lot of my uh, meetings with, with some colleagues and some students in video games. If we've both got a copy of the same online video game, we'll get together and we'll, instead of uh, having a dry Teams talk, we'll play a video game and we'll discuss there. <coughs> Sorry, we're still in the hay fever season for me. Um so this is one game that we play. This this is called Rocket League. Um, and you're basically a little car and you drive around playing football. And it's nice. Again, it takes a little bit of stress out of the meeting. It's um, it's something lighthearted. It's a break in play. It, and it feels like a break in the day as well. It feels like, a, you know, I can let my hair down 15 minutes, have a quick meeting, play a bit of Rocket League. And I just feel a little bit recharged to go back into the space. Now, not everybody likes video games. and Not everybody's going to feel confident to engage in this kind of interaction. And that's absolutely fine. Um, there's other ways that you can engage with games and play. Um, one of the things that I have done in the past, I've worked with a student. They had a, a chess set on their end. I had a chess set on my end. And we were playing a game of uh, distributed chess. You can get online versions of battleships and, and things like that, or even word games. Um, Icebreaking exercises, just, just playful engagements. Like um, one of my favorites, actually, is, is starting up um, a... A teams call a, a talk session online when I, mean, I used to do this um uh in different tools as well and just ask everyone right post one gif that describes your mood at the moment post one gif that describes your week and you get some really funny answers everyone has a good laugh everyone has a bit of enjoyment and it's just a really nice playful way to to set a tone and, and help put people at ease um, so I'd like to end with um, some awesome... Th this is my good news blog now. This I would like to end with some awesome practice by some awesome people. Um, so virtual peer mentoring. Um, there's been some absolutely fantastic from uh, work from uh, Lincoln Medical School uh, that Jess has been leading on. Um, working with students from the, the Nottingham Medical School to do some cross-mentoring. And I think that's just just awesome. Again, it's a really nice way to um, get students to engage, get students to learn from each other in a really kind of nice uh, outcome. Uh, psychology are doing loads of work, um, making sure that their various elements of their learning community, so peer mentoring, tutoring, tutoring student societies are all working together in a really kind of uh, collegiate way and everything's pulling together. Uh, one of my colleagues at Leeds... Um, they're doing this idea of tutoring families, which I really like, uh, tutoring families, families, um, where they're putting students in tutorial groups, one with peer mentors, student leaders, and lead academic with copy bars set up um, so they can, you know, you, you've got this kind of really nice model where you've got people coming together to discuss and have chats, and I just think it's brilliant. Um, one of my favourite ideas um, came from my colleague Helen in the, the nursing school, um, about creating spaces of to share stories about how the last six months have expand, uh, impacted students as people and in nursing, obviously, for frontline workers and learners. I mean, we've had nursing students out on the front lines um, helping the country fight against this this pandemic. I just, I genuinely, I think it's amazing. I'm genuinely, I'm so proud to just be in the same university as as our nursing students. I, I just think it's brilliant. Um and the nursing school is absolutely fantastic. And Helen's practice is, I just find it all inspiring. Um, but I really like this idea of creating sort of story spaces. Um, because no matter where we are, whether we were on the front line, whether we, you know, were, uh, I mean, I, I had a baby during, during, well, I didn't have a baby. My wife had a baby. I gained a baby, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think the way to phrase that. Um my life has changed so much since lockdowns happened. There's been so much stuff that's going on and I feel like I've got a lot of stories I want to share with people. 
And I know my students, like, again, when I talk to my students, you hear some of the stories they've got about how the last six months have worked. And I think getting those stories out and actually discussing them is, is so valuable because you know you're not alone. You know, you know that there's one of the best things I had was actually finding that one of my colleagues had had a baby at a very similar time to me. And I've been talking to them a lot. And, and it's really interesting. Some of our, our lockdown baby stories. Um, it's comforting. It helps, you know. So I really like this idea as a way of working with students. And again, um, if you don't follow uh, Helen on Twitter, um, do. She's, she, uh, some of her practice just astounds me. And I, I'll put a link to, to her Twitter. And, and all the Twitters of all the peop amazing people who've practiced I've stolen. Um, I'm going to put links down to that in the, the description of this YouTube video. Um, the business computing... Um, group at Hallam University, which I've just realized I've spelt Hallam wrong. I'm sorry, Sue. And that's really embarrassing for me because I'm a Sheffield boy. I'm born and bred Sheffield and I've spelt Hallam with one L. Um, that's the kind of thing that gets you disbarred. <laughs> um, so I really like the idea that they've, they've embedded um, the the personal two-task government role into a level four module. I really like that they've embedded it into the, into the program in such a meaningful way. Um, scheduled kind of you know way it's it's made tutoring not just this additional thing that students do but it, it's actually framed it within their learning experience um again another person who's doing about me stories and and talking about themselves and creating this shared space to talk um and 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 realize you're a lot on loan again sue's practice sue beckham her practice is just awe inspiring she's just one of the people who really really inspires me to um to try new things and, and just to be the best academic I can be. Um, and again, everybody who's practicing I'm stealing, um, I'm just going to be making sure that the, all their Twitter accounts are in this this YouTube video. So um, absolutely brilliant because I've not <laughs> referenced it on the slides, which is a really bad academic practice. So I'll slap my wrist for that one. Um, our School of Chemistry are doing a mix. So they're doing uh, a mix of face-to-face -face tutorage meetings with online drop-in sessions. And again, I really like this as a way of um, normalizing different channels of communication. I think the the kind of easy practice at the moment, well, the easy is the wrong word, but the obvious practice is to move things one way or another. You either move your tutorage online or you put it face-to-face. -face. And I like the fact that they've got this blend um, uh these these different kind of routes that students again it it gives students the option and it gives them flexibility it gives them choice and I think taking ownership having given the students choice that they can take ownership of their own tutorage I think is fantastic. Um, team building again an, another fantastic colleague uh, the foundation course um, normally do uh, a day of team building on astroturf. Um, and I really like this idea of tutor groups competing against each other in little competitions. Um, I think that's fantastic. And this year, they're, they're looking at doing different kind of games, maybe in collaborate. And again, we um, some online games, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, so absolutely, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to this video. I hope it's been of some use. Um, um, I'll say that do have a look in the YouTube, the YouTube description for all the fantastic people who have referenced, uh, although all the fantastic people who I haven't referenced, but really should, um, because they're awesome and they, they tweet some really, really useful stuff. Um, other than that, I just hope you have an awesome year and best of luck for the semester. Take care.